The humanities connect us, offering insights into people, places, events, and ideas. Humanities scholars illuminate these connections in their work, revealing previously unrecognized, sometimes unexpected links that advance our understanding of the human experience in profound ways. For instance, a path that leads from Shakespeare's witches to psychoanalysis in China. Magic, the occult, and the supernatural world appear repeatedly in Shakespeare's works, as discussed in fellow Mary Floyd Wilson's Occult Knowledge, Science, and Gender on the Shakespearean Stage. In turn-of-the-century Britain, interest in the occult captivated the imagination of the intellectual avant-garde, including W.B. Yeats, as explored in fellow Alex Owen's The Place of Enchantment, British Occultism, and the Culture of the Modern. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this evening's Fresh Off the Press book talk, where we invite National Humanities Center fellows to discuss their recently published works. I'm Robert Newman, President and Director of the Center, and it's my pleasure to serve as the host for this evening's event. Tonight, we're going to be talking with literary scholar Laura Murphy. Laura was a fellow at the center in 2017-18, and she is currently professor of human rights and contemporary slavery at the Helena Kennedy Center for International Justice at Sheffield Hallam University in the UK. Laura's research considers forced labor globally with a particular interest in first person accounts and survivor narratives. Her work, which has encompassed regimes of forced labor in India, Nigeria, Ghana, Canada, and here in the US has been supported by the National Endowment for the Humanities, the British Academy, the UK Foreign Commonwealth Development Office, the US Department of Justice, Haraz Foundation, Covenant House International, the Greater New Orleans Human Trafficking Task Force, and the City of New Orleans, as well as the National Humanities Center. Laura has recently been part of a team that created core competencies for medical professionals addressing human trafficking in healthcare settings with the US Department of Health and Human Services and her previous research on the intersection of homeless youth and human trafficking in the US and Canada provided a victim-centered community blueprint for how service providers can best assist youth at risk of trafficking. Laura serves as a subject matter expert in the field of human trafficking for the US Office of Victims of Crime and the Administration of Children and Families, and is also the chair of the Research Committee of HEAL, an organization dedicated to providing a public health lens to the field of human trafficking. She is currently focused on the Chinese government's internment and forced labor of people from the Uyghur region and the ways international supply chains are connected to those repressive systems. Laura's books on forced labor include Metaphor and the Slave Trade in West African Literature and The New Slave Narrative, The Battle Over Representations of Contemporary Slavery. She has served as editor of the volume Survivors of Slavery, Modern Day Slave Narratives. And her work has also been published in a variety of scholarly journals, including Slavery and, Ab and Abolition, the Journal of Human Trafficking, the Journal of, Afri of African Cultural Studies, Genre, and the Journal of Postcolonial Literary Inquiry. In Laura's latest book, Freedomville, the story of a 21st century slave revolt, she takes a deeper look at the story of the Azad Nagar, an Indian town founded by enslaved villagers that has been championed as an example of nonviolent revolution. She has graciously agreed to speak with us this evening about Freedomville and her work uncovering the dynamics surrounding forced labor in India and other places around the world. Please join me in welcoming Professor Laura Murphy.
Okay, sorry, I couldn't find my mute button, but um, is this, uh, is my screen sharing well? Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. great. Thank you, Robert, for that uh, elaborate introduction. Uh, thank, I really appreciate you. And I, it makes me, uh, it gives me sort of a headache hearing about all the, the different things that I've been working on lately. But I, um, I'm really grateful for this opportunity to uh, talk to you all and to have a chance to, to interact with the National Humanities Center again, because it, is, uh, the, it was the place where I closed out my last book project uh, on the new slave narrative. And, started, invented this new project on Freedomville. So I'm really excited to be able to share that with you. And I, I should, you know, I think my first slide here is a, is a photo of my class uh, at the National Humanities Center, because it was really uh, in conversation with many of these folks, uh, Harleen Singh, Avinash Singh, David Gilmartin, Libby Otto, Ted Ochoa, so many people just having lunch with them and talking about our ideas uh, led me to this project, which I will say is it's not an academic project, even in its conception. Uh, as I'll tell you the story of how I came to this project and I came to write this book, uh, you'll see that it's a, a slightly different trajectory than um, an academic book. And it has a completely different feel and different uh, even uh, narrative arc than, than an academic book would. So um, I appreciate you all coming out and, and having dinner with me or having your glass of wine, whatever it is you're doing. Um, and what I'll do today is a little bit, it, it may be a little bit different. It, I'm going to tell the story of, of the people of Ajad Nagar and of my interaction with them and how this book came to be. My research really um, focused, as uh, Robert was saying, on narratives of survivors of forced labor, modern day slavery, human trafficking around the world. And I was focused in on their narrative approach, how they told the story of their um, experience and of their freedom. And so, one of the ways that work began was uh, in 2005 or 2006, maybe even as early as 2000, no, it must have been 2006. I met some folks who worked for an organization called Free the Slaves in DC, who had made a video called The Silent Revolution about some people in, um, in India, in, uh, in Uttar Pradesh, in one of the poorest areas in the world, who had basically, overthrown people who had been their enslavers, people who had forced them to work transgenerationally without escape. Their parents and their grandparents had worked for the same family on the same land, sometimes doing agricultural work, sometimes doing uh, rock breaking. They, were, they worked in a rock quarry. And the story that Free the Slaves told in this video that they made was one of, uh, it was just an extraordinary one. And it, it, it literally changed my life. It, completely changed the trajectory of my work and my research um, and, and, and in many ways my life. And, and that is because in this story, the story they told of the people of, uh, of Ajad Nagar, this town, was a story in which people decided they had enough, fought back, overthrew the people who had been holding them in bondage, and took back the means of production, got their own rock quarry, started breaking their own rocks. Um, and it was a success story. And it made it seem, uh, or it, it, it made me realize that this was not an intractable problem, that there were things that people could do and that there was a reason to believe that survivor voices needed to be amplified uh, in these movements to help people understand their experiences. And so as a literary scholar, I came to that with that intention. Like how do we amplify the voices of those people who've survived this experience? I'm gonna play for you a, just a minute of the opening of the video because it's it's quite important to how I came to understand what was happening in that this area. So let's see if it'll work. <laughs> This is a story of death and despair, of hope and courage. This is the story of a village in northern India that risked everything to be free, and the revolution that made it possible. Azad Negar is one of the poorest villages in one of the poorest places on earth. 
Forty families live here. They don't even own blankets to protect themselves from the coming winter. But Azadnegar may just be the happiest place in the world. So the story that Free the Slaves told about um, about the people of Ajadnagar was that they were, um, that they had liberated themselves and that with the help of on the ground grassroots nonprofit organizations, they had managed to um, create a life for themselves. They were still breaking rocks um, in the quarry, but they owned the quarry themselves. And it was a decision they made for themselves. They could have tried to do other work, but the adults in the area, in particular the women, were invested in doing work that they knew how to do and um, and finding a way to educate their children so their children could walk walk away from rock quarry mining and agricultural labor. Um, but, you know, in the meantime, they thought, okay, we know how the rock quarry works. We know how to do this work. We know how to um, sell it where the market is. We know what the pricing is. We know how, you know, so let's do that. So they invested, they worked with some nonprofits to get the money. They pooled their own resources um, and they their meager resources as they were, but they managed to um, work through this government program to get a lease to a small rock quarry. And it was, um, it was just, a, it's just an incredibly inspiring story. Um, and one that, that, is, that is true. All of those things happened um, in Ajad Nagar. And these are some of the women who um, were part of that, uh, that uh, revolution, the silent revolution. And so I had the opportunity sort of as a uh, sort of a fluke of an opportunity in um, 2014, uh, 14 years after their revolt to go to India. And I thought, well, okay, what, what do I, what am I going to do to make, take advantage and make an opportunity out of this, uh, this chance to go to India? I said, I want to go talk to the people of Ajit Nagar. I want to know how they're doing nearly 15 years on from uh, their experience. And we knew that they had had a hard time, but they had built their own village. They'd named it Ajit Nagar, which meant Free Town or Freedomville, as the book is titled here in the U.S. In India, the edition is titled Ajit Nagar. Um, but they had created their own town and made their own way, sold their own rocks, sent their kids to school and were doing so much better. And I wanted to know 15 years on, how were they doing? And so I took a trip out to Ajad Nagar to meet the people I'd been studying all this time. I had in fact uh, published a collection with some of their narratives in it. I had listened to the transcripts, Free the Slaves Let Me Look at Their, use their transcripts from their, their videos for the film. I transcribed all these stories. I retold their story. I taught about them. And finally, I would get to go meet them. And so I did. I went back to meet the people of Ajad Nagar and I, I saw them there. This is a picture, a photo I took of uh, Sumara and Choti and women that I, whose stories I knew, whose voices I had heard for a long time. They, of course, had no idea who I was, but they'd been visited by a number of white strangers who came to understand what was happening in this place because of this, in part because of this video. And so I sat down with the people of Ajad Nagar to talk to them about their experiences. And I, I'll say that um, it was a long road to get there in part because the nonprofit organizations on the ground in uh, one in particular, in, uh, in Allahabad, which is near the town that they live in, really kept trying to prevent me from going to see these folks. And I couldn't figure out why. They took me to every village under the sun, like went all over the place uh, until finally they took me here. And I, I kept saying, I, I, I want to go to Ajad Nagar. And so I sat down with the folks and talked to them and got to hear from uh, the people who I'd been hearing from, including Rampal, who you saw um, breaking rocks in the video uh, just a moment ago melodramatic as that uh, that nonprofit, you know, uh, documentary is, the story that Ron Paul told when he sat down was essentially the same. It was the same narrative that I'd heard for 10 years um, when I learned about them. But this, this woman right here, um, and I had a translator, uh, a lot of the work I do, uh, you know, uh, is, is in languages I know, but the, you know, I do not know Hindi, these folks were, um, were talking to me very rapidly. The translator wasn't great either, but it was just sort of a, a visit, an exploratory visit. I didn't expect this to sort of turn into a major project. It was sort of just a, let me find out how they're doing and see if there's, you know, what's going on and how they're relating with Free the Slaves and the local nonprofits at this point, see if there's a way to help. So it turned out that they started, they started 
they, they were quite upset. They were saying that they had in fact been cut off from electricity, cut off from their entitlements, that, that the neighboring uh, families, the families in power, the families who had in fact held their families in bondage for generations were keeping them, preventing them from getting what was due to them. And <clears throat> someone says, well, you know, what, when we killed their brother, they wouldn't, they stopped giving us, you know, things that we needed. They didn't want to help us. They helped other villages. And I, you know, I asked the translator, could we back up? I, what, what did they mean when they killed the brother? Uh, and, and she said, well, oh, you know, when they killed him. And this, this lady here was like, and we hacked and we hacked and we had and we beat him, we beat him, we beat him. And she was making this hatchet, uh, like a uh, gesture with her hands. And I, you know, I said, please translate what this, this woman is saying. So my translator you know, is very reticent. She's very nervous. Um, and she translates for me. She tells me that in fact, these folks had not just sort of had a silent revolution. They had not had a nonviolent revolution. In fact, they had uh, killed one of the most dangerous, the most violent of the people who, uh, who were in the family of enslavers. And that they had in fact um, uh, maimed several others. And that not only had they um, had they gotten into a fight, un, you know, unplanned fight, they went to a meeting, which they knew that the the the, the slaveholding family was going to uh, bother them at, and they all brought weapons. The women had weapons in their hand. Some of them even had um, the the hammers that they used to break the rocks um, with them, intending to kill the, 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 the landlords. And it, this is not what I've heard. I just had to pause. I was just sort of like, hang on. Do they, you mean they dreamed of killing the landlords? They, they got together and talked about killing them? No, this was an intentional um, act of violence. Every means um, uh, of, of um, like sort of uh, every, uh, uh, official means to try to get their rights. They tried going to the government. They tried getting a lease for their, uh, the land. They tried to um, petition nonprofits. They tried all these different things. They tried having little self-help groups and taking out small loans and these kinds of things. And nothing was working. And they were finally fed up. There had been a, a sort of rash of violent attacks on them by this one man. And they determined that they were done, that that was it. They were not putting up with anymore. And they went to a meeting that was meant to be about voting in one of them into the like town um, council. But people came there with weapons in their food baskets to, to fight back. And this completely rewrote the story I heard. I went back and I looked at everything everyone had written and there was this sort of passive voice in the melee, uh, one of the landlords was killed or one of the landlords died, this kind of thing. And it, it was in a passing reference that people always said in the passive voice, even I had said it, um, thinking that they're like maybe a rock had hit him in the head or, you know, like when they when they fought back the because the, the the landlords like shot guns and like ran at them and tried to attack the women. And so then they fought back. That was the story. They fought back. But they fought back. Not in that moment. They fought back for years, for generations of violence that had been enacted upon them. And they admitted it at this point at the end of you know, 15 years of, of dealing with uh, continued injustice. The story was true. They had gathered at this big place to have a, 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 a rally essentially to try to get somebody voted in. They had in fact built up Ajad Nagar um, from the, you know, the ground up because their own little village before had been burned down, but they built it right next to the, the they, they had to build it on land that they had been in before. It was right next to the people who had had power over them for a lot of time. They, they were mainly unemployed. They had been cut off from most of the resource and most of their entitlements because of the violence they had uh, committed. And, you know, it, it was, it was sort of the, the retaliation was, it was brought down upon, you know, the whole community as well as their children and the, you know, the families that had been, um, sort of the, in the spotlight of this incredible revolution that we were all celebrating in the rest of the world, we're in fact being cut off from 
uh, what they what they rightfully deserved and were being cut off from the very freedoms that they were supposedly getting access to. So I went back with research assistants and with a team of folks to, to try to understand what they were doing and try to reconnect them with grassroots community organizations that were helping them because they also had felt abandoned by them. We sat and we talked so that this is the woman again who is telling her story about hacking and beating and beating and beating. And we asked them to tell their stories and they all came ar together around two figures. Um, oh, and I should back up and I should say, at this point, I realized that what I have is not an academic book. I have a murder mystery. I don't understand how it is that they've, uh, they, they have hidden this murder all for so long. I don't understand why they've shifted the way they're telling the narrative at this point. Um, and, and, and I should admit that during my sabbatical, I also took a two week uh, private investigators class because I had this dream of, and that's just sort of a, a little aside, but um, I had this idea that, you know, there, you know, I, I, I don't know, I just, I had this idea about investigating crimes. And so some part of me thought, okay, well, this story needs to be told differently and it needs to be told more publicly and it needs to, to be, um, to, to follow a different kind of narrative than the one where nonprofits just sort of pull your heartstrings about, um, about a community and then sort of forget all of the complications of what happened and what the consequences are. And so I started to, to talk to them about what they thought was important about this story. And they talked about, they talked a lot about two organizers who had come and worked with them um, before and after the, the revolution happened. Before the revolution happened, there was a man called Kanchuki, and I actually keep this man's picture on my desk now because he's kind of a he's a, a, a incredible role model. But uh, Kanchuki uh, was a man who had gone to college, but who had decided that he wanted to spend his life helping people who were in the the, the tribes and 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 lower castes uh, in the in the Indian sort of caste system, and he would spend the night in folks' houses. He slept on the ground. He ate the food they ate. And he, to him, to, to the community of Ajad Nagar, Kanchuki was a folk hero in a lot of ways because he was there spreading rumors, giving them stories about how they could be free, telling them parables about how, how they could be free, but also telling them what the law was and saying, look, this is it's against the law for you to be in bondage for people transgenerationally. This is not okay. Um, and he worked on the lower frequencies to, to help people to understand what their rights were. Meanwhile, this Amar Saran was a high court judge and he was able to be working in the, the, the official channels to help them get a lease, help them get out of jail once they had this melee, once they plotted this revolution. And these two folks helped them navigate this system that was, um, that was you know, basically oppressing them for generations. And, and together they were able to work on completely different registers to bring, um, bring about the possibility for liberation for these folks. And it, and it worked, it's true. I mean, it's not like Free the Slaves uh, had, not, um, had not told a true story. The story they told was true, but what they had left out was that violence. And that violence affected everyone. Kanchuki had to go in hiding, into hiding. He was, um, he was uh, fired from his job as a result of this. And, and Amar Saran remains, a, a, he's a retired high court judge now too, but he had a lot of friction as well and, and still continued to work with the community and to get their story out and constantly be helping them get into the press about, about what had happened to them. And it was about uh, it, and it was in part because of these two folks too that the narrative of the nonviolent narrative of the nonviolent revolution came to be. That story was more um, effective for them in getting the assistance of the government, in getting journalists to cover their story. These helpless tribal people who have, you know, given everything up, who've been violated for so long, and here we are. We need to help them, and so they they created a narrative that was appealing, that was able to bring free the slaves into the story. It had drama, but it was not uh, a violent revolution that they told. And I think that one of the main, one of the main points that I, I have to make in the book is how critical it is for us to like understand that 
while we might glorify, we might think it's wonderful when there's a nonviolent revolution, violent revolution is a real thing. It is a necessary thing. And that these are folks who did not take up violence as their first um, response to violence. They took violence of violence as the last and only response they could take up after years of trying official routes to justice. And this was the, the last straw, but understanding that violence is one of the tools that, um, that is both denied the most oppressed people, right? Like the police have the right to violence. The, the landholders had been violating them, raping them, beating them, for generations, but we say, oh, oppressed people can't can't commit violence. That makes them somehow um, abject, right? That that makes them unworthy of our consideration and our concern. And so that is one major uh, problem with, you know, any kind of human rights work where we eliminate the right of the poor and the oppressed to use the tools that people have been using against them all this time. And then on the other side that, um, oh shoot, I forgot what the other side is now. I know I had another point on that front. Oh, and that we have to understand that there are consequences when that happens. If we deny that violence is one route to justice and we don't, uh, then what we can't do is make sure that people are protected in the aftermath of that violence. And so Free the Slaves said, okay, great. They've got a lease to their land were set. Um, and of course, they supported them for some time. But, um, you know, in a lot of ways, they were left to their own devices. Um, that success story was told, and they were not the consequences of violence, they're being cut off, they're being so close to the cut off from their, their entitlements, but also still so close in proximity to the family that had, um, had harmed them in the first place, meant that there needed to be another route, another way of supporting this community for like long term freedom. And that was missed because of this desire for um, the story of, of, uh, of, of nonviolence. The other story I think that we are very quick to uh, attach ourselves to is the idea that people who are oppressors in a community are just evil. And I feel like this exonerates us from thinking about the systems that create um, oppression and the systems that support oppression like this. And so, or support, you know, forced labor, like we're talking about today. And so one of the things I thought was super important was that I got a chance to talk to the family who were the landholding family. And this um, is uh, 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 Mahindra Patel. He is the, actually the, the sort of mayor of this area that they live in. And he is, um, he is cousins with the guy who was killed. And he was called back um, at the time, uh, just before the revolt, because their, their mother had died and he was in town. And so he saw what went down at that time. And he admitted that this cousin was a, a violent um, uh, menace, a real problem for him either, even. Um, and he was working to try to patch up the, the relationship between the community of Ajad Nagar, this small little village within the larger community, and with his family. And I didn't entirely understand why, and I didn't even know if I should believe him, but the people of Ajad Nagar said, no, this guy's different. They had gone through 10, 15 years of people who had, um, like I said, cut them off and had uh, tried to um, punish them and had brought them to court, uh, had tried to, um, to undermine their ability to keep the lease, et cetera. And this guy was coming in to kind of change that. And trying to understand that, trying to understand how a community um, manages to, to create some kind of unity after such violence was also part of the book. And I don't want to give everything away that's in the book because some of it, you know, unfolds in kind of mysterious ways. But, um, but the, this guy, it, it was important to, to note too that, you know, this family of, of people who had um, essentially enslaved people for generations, they were part of a culture in which they believed like 19th century slaveholders did that, um, that they were uh, helping the people of the region, that the poor people couldn't help themselves. This kind of paternalistic uh, mythology was rampant among this cast of people, or at least in this, this area. 
Um, and they, um, they believed that actually the end of, uh, of the bonded labor system in their region had, had broken down relationships between people, that they, it, had, it was a negative consequence for the poorest people in their area. And so breaking down their um, ideas, their sort of self-congratulatory mythologies that they had built up about their role in the community was part of, of under, you know, like unpacking the, the story there for the book. Um, and I'm trying to think of what, what I want to say and what I don't want to say. But this, this one figure um, does assist in creating some kind of unity. But this is in part because, in fact, even his, his community, his family, doesn't represent the kind of landholding class that you imagine when you think about antebellum slavery or some other kind of, uh, of, of landholders or, or in, enslavers. This was his room. This was the house he lived in, a very small house. And what was part of what was bringing them together, the reason why it was politically critical that the mayor of the town stop excluding the poorest people was because now they had a common enemy. And that was multinational corporations that were taking over the quarries that the landholders had profited from. The, the coal people, the, the, the people of Ajad Nagar had, um, had made their living on since they had been liberated or they liberated themselves. Um, multinational corporations were coming and taking over that land and basically clearing it of all of the, um, and, and in rapid fashion, of all of the um, resources that these communities had been living on. So this strange turn of events had happened where, where the, the people in the um, landholding caste uh, and, and you know, sector in that town were suddenly beholden to all the minds and bodies and votes of the people who had previously been their, um, their victims, their, their subjects in a lot of ways. And so, um, so they were trying to join forces to fight these bigger companies that were coming in, clearing out the land of all the rocks in quick fashion and basically impoverishing these, this region even more, but impoverishing even the people who had previously been privileged. This is an image here that I think about a lot that um, where a temple, uh, a person who was running this temple refused to let like any ground go when the, the, the big machines were coming to clear out, these crushers were coming to, well, not the crushers, but the, um, the no, I don't know what these tools are called, you know, backhoes, I don't know. Anyway, when they were coming to, to court rock, you know, court, like mine, all this rock, they held out and they held strong. And so they left one tiny island with this temple on top of it. And this is just a photo of the temple that I like uh, even more. But you can see where they've just completely carved out this, you know, a whole segment of this region down to the, the bare bones and leaving almost nothing. And so the people of the region, especially the young kids who would be of the age to start working and start making their own lives, were then in a situation where they could not get jobs in this region. They were, um, uh, the big rock quarry mining companies were bringing in their own laborers. There was a big caste divide in who was being allowed to work. And the people of the coal uh, community, the Ajad Nagar community, were again um, uh, marginalized in the economy of the region. And so they were now going out to, um, to, to Delhi and to other cities to work, where, of course, they were at risk of being trafficked or being harmed or being exploited in some way for their work. Uh, again, and so part of it, part of the work we were doing there with uh, a nonprofit was um, uh, like sensitizing them, they say in India, but, you know, educating people to understand the risk of trafficking and to talk about contracts and talk about pay and their rights and stuff like that. And so because people were having to go out to do more work. Now, people are still doing some artisanal off license, uh, illegal mining uh, in that region, but when they do it, they can be arrested because now basically these massive corporations, which are paving roads for the Modi regime are, um, are making it essentially illegal for people to maintain their way of life. And so there was this sort of roller coaster ride of, of systems of oppression that the coal people get the worst end of, no matter the coal people or the, the tribal people is the particular the designated tribe that they're a part of. Um, and they, um, 
they, they are now again um, being uh, marginalized in this new economy that is supposedly um, helping uh, through the Modi government to pave roads for the poorest people in the country, but in fact is, is, is eliminating them from the economy and from the work that they're able to do. So they become even more um, uh, uh, vulnerable to other forms of exploitation. This picture is just there because I need to always remember uh, these guys, Aman Kumar and Ajay uh, Maria, who were my research team on the ground there. They were amazing and they were also better at selfies than I was. Um, but they uh, they are a massive part of the story, but like, unfortunately, our, my editor cut almost every section that featured them uh, to keep the book very short and accessible. But they are extraordinary minds. Uh, Aman on the, on the, well, I don't know what side it's on for you, the left, um, is, I guess the left, um, is uh, now has a PhD himself and is doing research on, on human trafficking in India. So um, we've done, uh, uh, I cannot say that I did this project alone in any way. Um, and so I want to, I just kind of want to stop there. Uh, there's more storytelling than theorizing there, but I'd be happy to talk about any of the ideas that came from, uh, from that work and to take your questions and to, to hear your thoughts. Thanks. Thank you so much, Laura. Um, I need you to unshare your screen so I could, I could monitor the chat. Absolutely. Does that work? Great. Yeah, it's perfect. Thank you. Well, I, I just have, I have myself just so many questions for you. Um, let me start with, you're talking about violent revolution as a, as a rational response. And I'm wondering your thoughts about how that kind of complicates our American Western received notions of freedom. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for that. I think one of the biggest takeaways is, is thinking about the rationality of violence. I think we um, we sort of cordon violence off into the realm of the irrational. And like I said before, it's perfectly rational for uh, empowered people to use violence uh, in the way we discuss it often, but not for those who are the least empowered. And so I think it's it's really important to, to look violence in the eye as a, as a tool of, of revolution, as a legitimate rational tool of, of revolution. But how does that play against our ideas about nonviolence? Well, I, you know, I like to remind people a lot of times about <laughs> about what uh, what it took for the U.S. to have freedom. All those patriots, um, we talk about patriots all the time uh, in, in regards to the American Revolution, for instance, right? But but those patriots were were traitors who <laughs> were okay with violence if that's what it took to to get what they considered to be right. So violence is often at the foundation of revolutions and yet we don't talk about it. Um, we, we like to look away from it. We like to glamorize the stories of revolutions so that they are um, palatable. But I don't, and I think that that does a real disservice to the, um, the complicated uh, reality of violence and the, the sometimes probably necessity for violence. People often say, uh, Oh, are you advocating for violence? And I guess I'm advocating for making it so that people who are, uh, you know, most unempowered don't have to turn to violence. I'm advocating for having legitimate official means for people to get re uh, redress for for violations. I'm advocating for workers' rights. I'm advocate, but shy of that, I'm just saying this is the reality, and we need to both face it. Uh, head on because it is the reality that we as a society, as many societies, press people to. And it's also a reality that we have to address once those revolutions have happened. So in this work and, and also in, uh, in some of your previous work, um, you talk, it's kind of a two-part question. You, you, you talk about how there are over 40 million enslaved people globally. Mm -hmm. And th this is just a shocking number for, mm -hmm. for I'm sure most of your, your listeners uh, this evening. You also talk about, uh, you insist a kind of, on a kind of precision, a literal meaning in terms of uh, the word slave. You kind of resist metaphor. 
Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you insist on kind of an adjectival rather than uh, using slave as a noun. I wonder if you can talk about that a little bit more and also how this particular story computes with our, our modern American notions of what slavery is. And yeah. how, how's it similar, how's it different? Yeah, this is a complicated and difficult question for good reason. Um, I think that, as you were saying, I think that we should not take the language of slavery lightly. We should not use that word. I, I often say things like, you know, you hear students saying things like, my teacher is a slave driver. Mm -mm. No, no, I, just, I have no time, no patience for, for metaphorical uses of, um, of slavery. I'm also, uh, aware that there are people who, um, particularly in the African-American community, um, who are sensitive about the use of the word slavery to mean too many things. And this is for good reason as well. People in the anti-trafficking movement, anti-slavery movement have um, often used uh, the word slavery in sort of broad strokes to describe anything that they think is bad sometimes. Um, and often to protect not the least vulnerable, but the like some incredibly empowered people. Um, and so you, you find people um, using slavery to designate, um, uh, you know, white daughters being, you know, uh, engaging in sex work vol vol voluntarily. And that's not slavery. And this is, you know, this is partially why people are sensitive about it, but it's also the case that, you know, antebellum slavery in the United States was an extraordinary, um, uh, iteration of slavery. But slavery has existed for, unfortunately, for as far as we know, most of human history. It unfortunately will probably continue to exist um, as so long as people are willing to fully exploit the life and labor of, of other humans. And I think that it's important that we call enslavement by its rightful name, that we say, okay, when we're talking about people who are forced to work against their will, um, usually being threatened, uh, often being unpaid, um, usually having some kind of violent regime that holds them in it. Um, and I can think of many, many, many different iterations of this from all over the world, from all of human history. Um, these are the salient characteristics of slavery. And while the US system was an extraordinarily violent and brutal one, um, these characteristics of slavery uh, sort of adhere across time and place. And so when we talk about, when we talk about contemporary forms of slavery, um, that's what we're talking about. Now, I'll admit that I, te I tend to lean towards forced labor these days. And I've used slavery in a lot of my writing in part because that's the language that survivors themselves are using. And one of my, the, the book that I completed at the, the NHC is in part about where that idea came from and how survivors came to be using uh, that language. But, um, but I also think it's important to put a fine point on it. This is, uh, we're talking about people who are forced to work against their will, often transgenerationally as is, is the case in, uh, in, in India, uh, typically without a sense of when, or always without a sense of when it's gonna end in some sort of captivity um, where they do not know uh, when they will be allowed to be free and who are not allowed to walk away. And that's really the linchpin, right? These folks who are forced to work and cannot walk away. And that's what was happening here in, in India. So I like using the precise term. You also mentioned using adjectival as saying enslaved people so that we um, don't sort of essentialize people as slaves. And this is a movement that's you know, far predates me and that is a part of um, you know, the work or that I borrow from the work of, of African-American scholars uh, whose work I, I admire. And that is a general move away from saying slave to using enslaved and using enslaver. I use slaveholder occasionally. I use, um, uh, I don't use slave ever, but like I, I was, I, I, honestly, I was listening to Tia Miles's All That She Carried the other day. I, I didn't read it, I listened to it, it's a new thing for me. Um, but she talked about, she wrote about, um, using different terms to vary the language. It's hard to write enslaver uh, every time. And so we're always, we're all working on getting better at this and all working to have a shared language that is both um, uh, writerly, but more importantly, just. I hope that got at what you were. Yeah, that, very much so. Yes. Thank you. So uh, one of our listeners, Ben, uh, asks, how do the people of Azad Nagar 
uh, understand their own relationship with historical debates about violent and nonviolent forms of resistance within Indian society? Yeah, Ben, thanks for that question. They, um, admittedly, they were very concerned mostly about their ability to access uh, local justice systems. So for the most part, when they talked about their, um, and so I draw my ideas from them and sort of make these sort of more global theories about it, but really it's, it comes from their insistence that it was the violence itself that, that allowed them to get what they needed and the violence that was, that was cutting them off from what they needed. And so they were walking this uh, challenging line uh, that, that, that they knew that they, that they had no regrets. They, they, were, they were very much celebrating the violence that they had committed and, and had no sense that they had, um, they had unnecessarily crossed that line. In fact, th there were some people who were, you know, some some of the older men were still threatening some of the families nearby, um, and so the they had a sense of its necessity, and it as a last resort, but they also had a sense of it as um, as the thing that was was uh, was angering the, the neighboring communities and trying to figure out how to get justice at a level that was not as local, because at that local level, the resentment was still there, trying to get other people to see their rights as inherent or as um, at least their due, um, despite the violence. And so sh that shifting narrative was one that they were consciously aware of and one that they were using uh, effectively uh, to some extent. I hope that answers it. Yeah, so Alice wants to know, what are the young people of Azadak are doing? Yeah, so um, thanks for that, Alice. The, the, so the one person that I showed there who's a young, uh, the older teenager, uh, Santos, he is um, working in Delhi. He is, um, he does some cleaning at a, a, a construction site, essentially. He likes his job a lot. He uh, said that several of the, people, some of the young people from the, uh, um, from Aja Nagar and, and a couple of the older ones. In fact, Sumara, who was one of the women I showed earlier had also gone with them to Delhi to clean. And he said that he had a really sweet gig that the, he'll, he had a certain amount to clean. Once that cleaning was done, nobody assigned him more work. It was like, he knew exactly what he had to do every day. It wasn't this endless labor. Um, but they were aware of people who had been exploited or who had been unpaid, and they were feeling very lucky about this connection that they had in Delhi. But, you know, there was also this kind of interesting um, resistance to continuing to tell this story of revolution. Santos was um, uh, like five or six years old when the, the revolution happened. So he must, he must be, he must have been like 17, 20, 20 when I went to see him. So he was five or six years old when the, the revolution happened and he, or revolt, um, and he remembers it was terrifying. He ran into the, the woods and he hid there and he thought that his family may be dead and he wasn't sure where he was, what he was gonna eat. And he eventually made his way back to the family. But, um, but he was sick and tired of people telling that story. It was the like sort of central, um, uh, it was a central narrative for the older generation. And for him and the younger people, they were just like, old oh, people get over yourselves. Like, look at what we have going on. We are still poor. We are still breaking rocks. We need to figure out something else and stop glorifying this moment that didn't bring us what we expected. Um, and so I think that they were, they were pretty there was a sort of a generational divide there, but many of them were going to work in Delhi doing sort of manual labor. Um, some of them were still doing agricultural work in that in that area um, and certainly were doing agricultural work to continue their own you know, sustenance who were there, but many people had left and gone to the city to do manual labor. So Libby would like to know. Hey Libby. There you go, I, I, I know you're familiar. Uh, your work clearly reveals that perspective and the power to narrate fundamentally shape our understanding of justice. Are you continuing this work in other contexts? Oh, that's interesting, Libby, thank you. Uh, I mentioned Libby at the, the outset because Libby was one of my great interlocutors at the, the um, uh, NHC and I'm, I'm 
pleased to be able to say we're still very good friends and I'm super excited to hear your question. And um, I'll also say um, that one of the, the like, great moments of, of writing this book was that I, I, had, I had a really um, I had a sort of rocky moment with my editor because he cut so much. They really wanted it to be a tiny book. And I, I mean, if you see it, it's, it's like 130 very tiny pages. Um, and so it's, it's very small. Yes, it's a, it's a petite little book. And that their whole, the series, uh, it's a Columbia Global Reports uh, book. It's, uh, this series is meant for the um, intelligent but busy reader or curious but busy. And I really love that tagline because I, I, I totally get that feeling. Um, but one day after he had done all this cutting, uh, the editor was reworking my blurb and he said it was a Rashomon-like tale. And I just thought, okay, that's exactly before that, that I wanted to have these various different perspectives so that we understand that there's no monolithic evil at work in oppression. There's no person who comes out of this totally with their hands clean. They're, you know, the people who are the heroes are, uh, have committed murder. Um, there are, there are um, you know, some folklore type characters that they, you know, created out of their own storytelling, um, but who are real folks who are, you know, struggling just like everybody else. And so I wanted to tell that, um, to tell that from multiple different perspectives. And um, it's interesting that you ask about how that's uh, connected to my current work, because the unfortunate truth is that what I'm working on right now is exclusively focused on uh, the Uyghur people of, of, of Northwestern uh, China who have been put into internment camps. I'm sure most of you have heard about this. Um, uh, one tenth of the population there has been put into these internment camps, and uh, about a about a fifth of the people have been put into forced labor. And so I've quickly learned. I've teamed up with some people who do supply chain tracing and and who do Chinese language research, and we've been documenting the cases of forced labor there and documenting how the products of that forced labor make it to international markets. The strange thing is that even though like my expertise, my training has, and my inclination has always been about amplification of the voices of survivors, about lending my platform and my privilege as a sort of megaphone for survivors who've experienced this, people with lived experience. That is not possible in this case because almost no one has been able to escape this situation in, in uh, this crisis in the Uyghur region in the last five years. There are a handful of survivors who've been able to testify and we work with them as best we can. We amplify their voices, we tell their stories. But a lot of what we have to do is use government directives, government records, corporate propaganda and uh, campaigns against themselves to show where they're engaging in these programs that are uh, just one of the most extraordinary uh, systems of, of forced labor and oppression that, that I've ever encountered. And so it's been a real departure for me, but one of the things that I'm doing with this work is I have a team of researchers from the affected community who are my colleagues and my co-authors. Some of them remain anonymous. Um, some of them are actually pe people who have escaped the camps um, uh, or whose family members are in the camps, but, um, we work together to to try to like for me like to try to mentor them into to doing this kind of work and to be able to do the research, um, but also to try to amplify the voices of the people on the ground so they have connections in the region and we're able to sort of get those stories out um, and to document them as well. There are a couple of organizations that are just trying to collect stories of people now already. And that work is incredibly important. And I, 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 hi, I highly recommend that you all go to check out the um, Xinjiang Victims Database. And if you have the opportunity to make a donation, I've never done this before, I think you should. Um, but the Xinjiang Victims Database is working on a shoestring. Those folks are eating beans out of cans to collect all the stories and document the stories of the, of the survivors of, those, of, of the crisis in the Uyghur region. So yeah, that's what I'm doing now. Thank you. So Jacqueline uh, asked this question. Uh, your work takes place at the intersection of scholarship and activism. In methodological terms, do you think that field work and practical interventions are and should be a crucial part of contemporary human rights scholarship? So I don't want to be prescriptive for other people. I think that there is a role for academic research that works in the academy that it's published in uh, you know, academic journals. And I think that that 
work helps to, um, it goes a long way to, to um, legitimizing, authenticating, authorizing the work of people on the ground. It shows, you know, we need statisticians to figure out just exactly how many people do we think are enslaved. I don't care about that number. I could not care less about that number. Um, but apparently uh, legislators need those kinds of numbers to, to act. Um, they, you know, and so like having the kinds of resources that the academy has and the, um, the legitimacy and the authority, authority is the word I was looking for, the authority to sort of, and, and the, the research skills to really do refined rigorous work to prove human rights violations is important but it's just a foundation. And I think for me, and I'm not saying this is for everyone, but for me, I couldn't, I couldn't do that academic work any longer. And especially with this case of, of uh, the, we the crisis in the Uyghur region, it was so urgent and so immediate and, and I think so necessary like to, to act now to prevent how, ways it might've gotten worse that I kind of just let go of my academic um, uh, like expectations for how things get published and how things circulate and um, but did not get rid of my academic rigor and that has been critical and uh, I think that a lot of some human rights research can be sort of um, sort of feel goody like the like the story of Ajahn Nagar before and what's important is like having that kind of like uh, nobody's objective, um, but like distance rigor that can be contribute that can contribute, but that is still accessible, and that is is useful by government, useful by not by nonprofits, useful by stakeholders and people in the affected community as well. That has been so really important to me, and my so my academic training has served me well. My my knowledge that I need to partner with people with expertise, my respect for expertise, um, so that I don't wander into things I personally don't know anything about. Um, all that has served me well in like making this transition uh, to being a scholar activist. But I will also say it, I'm very much supported by my university and my chair, and I might not be able to do that uh, uh, without them. But if that were the case, I would have quit academia. Boom. So let me ask you a, a, a rather personal question. So. You're working with really difficult, taxing, uh, emotional um, work. Uh, the stories that you're telling, the uh, what you're unpacking is is ex extremely powerful uh, and penetrating. And you know, I'm just thinking about watching every night the PBS News Hour and reading the New York Times about Ukraine and how drained I feel yeah. <laughs> as a result. Yeah. So, talk to us a little bit about uh, how you keep going. And um, what motivates you uh, to continue to, to tell these stories and, and to sort of keep your wits about you while you're doing it? Yeah, thanks. Uh, I wear these glasses so you can't see that I haven't slept. No, <laughs> I'm exhausted. I think we're all exhausted. And I, I, I can't think of a professional I know who's not working five people's jobs. You know, I think we're all tired. And um, I think that it's it's hard when you do the kind of work I do um, where you're facing people's trauma all the time and, and working with folks who are traumatized and, and working through that. But um, but it, but life is exhausting right now. It doesn't matter if you're like right there in the belly of the beast. But I, I think that for me, a couple of things uh, keep me going. A couple of things I think are important. One is that I, I do work a lot directly with people who have lived experience of the, the crises and the, the traumas that I'm talking about. <laughs> They're not tired. They just keep working. I mean, they get tired, right? And we do a lot of like debriefing and talking about self-care and, you know, talking about, you know, eating and sleeping and, you know, that we can't work until we pass out because then the work won't get done. But, um, but I also just, I admire the survivors and I, I, I try to, you know, sort of model my behavior on theirs that they, they know that this is critical and they are gonna keep doing it. But the, the other part is that I, I've made a lot of life decisions that I think are important for 
my well-being. And I don't think we do this enough as academics. I think that we just work ourselves into the ground and we go around saying to each other, oh, I'm, I'm working all the time, I'm working all the time. And, and, and that just, that's unsustainable. And so when I took this new job, I, I'm, I'm very serious when I say that I was considering in leaving academia. When I took this job that I have now, it's 100% it's research and that is a rare thing, uh, but I'm very lucky to have it. And I was going to do my research and do what I thought was important in the world through another venue if I had to. Getting this job also allows me to live uh, uh, in New Orleans for a good part of the year or some part of the year. And uh, that means I get to dance in the street and I get to go out with my friends and you know, I get to, uh, yes, there was the gay Easter parade on Sunday and I get to wear giant hats and put on costumes. If you go to check out my Facebook, you'll see all my costumes. Um, I probably shouldn't say that live, um, but I, you know, I, I look I, the metaphor for it is I dance in the street as often as possible and I shake it off. And I think that that is, that is critical. And whatever you're dancing in the street is, um, it should be dancing in the street. I, I'll, I'll go ahead and prescribe that. But if it's not dancing in the street, whatever it is, crocheting, whatever it is that gets you happy. Uh, I think we have to do it and we have to carve car out time for it. I see we've got to go, but uh, I'm glad to get a chance to talk to y'all. Well, Laura Murphy, thank you so much uh, all. I'm all for dancing in the street. Um, this has been an incredibly powerful and in inspiring conversation and presentation. I want to thank uh, all of our viewers as well. Uh, thank you very much for your interesting questions and for your participation. This evening's event has been recorded. It will be available on the National Humanities Center's YouTube channel. Please click the subscribe button and the notify bell to be notified of future discussions and other videos from the center. You may also visit nationalhumanitiescenter.org to learn more about the center's work and other opportunities to explore the humanities. Good evening, everyone. Stay well. Thank you.